be reading from the book of Luke, the book of Luke chapter 2, book of Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 21, book of Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. While you're turning, I want to uh, welcome a part of my extended family out in Phoenix in our service today. Joshua is here. He drove all the way here from Phoenix, Arizona to be here tonight. Well, not really. Brother Randy drove, Joshua prayed all the way from Phoenix, Arizona. But I'm glad to have you here. He's part of the family there at the church there in Phoenix, Arizona. Joshua, young guy, 17 years old. Welcome to extreme southern Arkansas. Been here for a few days. It's been his first uh, time in this part of the country. And uh, he, of course, and uh, Janice and Randy, part of my family here in Columbia County. I'm glad to have you all in the service. I'm glad that you came, and I'm glad that we can spend a little bit of time and finish up kind of the Christmas narrative. The events uh, in this passage of Scripture happened uh, a little over a week after the birth of Christ and about a month after the birth of Christ. So even though it's not Christmas Day, even though it's not all part of the manger scene, it is very much a part of the arrival of Jesus, and it tells us a lot uh, about God's continuing plan and God's continuing working in the lives of so many people when this event happened in Luke chapter 2, beginning of verse 21, would you stand as the scriptures read, please? And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Now when the days of your purification according to the law of Moses were completed, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit he should not see death, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. So when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace. According to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for the face of all peoples, a light to bring the revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, for a sign which shall be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, Of the tribe of Asher, she was of great age, had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, and this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in at that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for redemption in Jerusalem. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for the Christmas narrative. We thank you that it is not just a story, it's history. We thank you for all this story involves. And as we just look at some of the details tonight, just a few of them, we ask that you would bless us with an understanding of your word and how it applies to us and remind us of these things when we need them the most. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. This whole passage of scripture really is a verification of a statement that was made by Matthew earlier in the Christmas narrative. In chapter 1, verse 19 of Matthew, it is said of Joseph, he was a just man. And in verse 24 of the same chapter, we read of Joseph, he was an obedient man. He did what the angel of the Lord commanded him when the Lord commanded him, don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. You take her to be your wife. You take care of her. 
you be the father and the leader of this family. And he told him all that would happen. And then Joseph did what God told him to do. And he named the child Jesus, just like the angel had told him, just like the angel had told Mary. It was a verification of an earlier statement that Joseph was indeed a just man. And he brought the child to the temple after eight days, just like the law of the Lord would say, just like God's law would say. Leviticus chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, this lines everything out of this. And then, of course, at that time was the official naming of the child. Just what the law said, he did exactly what the law said, and they named the child Jesus exactly what the angel said. And then, about 30 days later, about a month later, they came in again. And it was a, a purification ritual, and it was also an offering that was made to the Lord. And all this is outlined in the book of Leviticus. And if you notice, it says it's written in the law of the Lord in this passage. That's what Joseph and Mary did. It's quite interesting, if you notice, they offered a sacrifice according to the law of the Lord. There's that phrase again, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. When this rule or this instruction was made, God said, if a family can afford it, bring a lamb. But if a family cannot afford a lamb, bring two turtle doves, two young pigeons. This is what they offered, which told us Mary and Joseph knew what it was like to live on very limited means. They could not afford a lamb. And you know what this was called when someone would come and offer a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons? It was called the offering of the poor. The offering of the poor. That's the station of life the king of glory was born into a very poor, hard-working family. They knew what it was like to have to watch every penny. They knew what it was like to perhaps do without. They knew what it was like to work hard. They didn't have anything extra. This was how Jesus came into the world. So when Jesus came to be plunged into humanity, he came to be plunged into a working, very limited financial means family. So we know what we go through, what people go through. But we have a validation of the angel's message in this passage of Scripture. The message, of course, by the angels was in chapter 1, verse 17. Chapter 1, verse 17. He'll go before him in the spirit of the Lord and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to children, to make... The, uh, to the, and the uh, disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And in chapter 2, verse 10, it says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. The angels gave this message to Zacharias that the Lord's coming. There'll be a forerunner. And he knew what that meant to be the forerunner of the Lord. The Lord's come to the shepherds. But then we have two more witnesses. These witnesses, of course, first of all, Simeon. Simeon, as we see here, it says of this man, we look at his character, he was a devout and just man. He was a just man and devout. Now, I think we looked at these two terms before when we were looking at Zacharias. And this is not just a repetition of just the same term. The word just concerned his standing with God. It was the same as being righteous. It did not describe his demeanor or his outward activities. It described his standing before a holy God. And his standing was he was a just man because it described his inward spiritual condition. If we remember, Abraham believed God, it was imputed unto him for righteousness. You see, that righteousness is the righteousness of God that comes by faith, as of course the apostle Paul would say. This is not righteousness according to what he had done. This was not the fact he was just in his standing with God according to his own merit. He was just in his standing with God because of his faith 
in the coming Messiah. And he trusted that God would send a Savior. And because of his trust in that Savior who was to come, he was declared just and righteous in the sight of God. Well, what does devout mean? Devout means his outward conduct reflected his inward condition. That's important. That's important for us as we go through the upcoming year. We've been declared righteous. We've been declared, of course, just in the eyes of God. We know the Lord, and we know, of course, that our standing with him is right. Our outward demeanor and our outward behavior should reflect that. So just is his inward condition. Devout is his outward conduct, and he was steadfast in his faith. It says of him he was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Now this word waiting means he was expecting. Now if you notice in your Bible the consolation of Israel, that word consolation is capitalized. It means comfort. It means peace. It means the Messiah. The consolation of Israel was another term they used for the coming Messiah, and he was waiting and anticipating eagerly because he believed the promises in the Old Testament. The Old Testament had promised a coming Savior, and he was waiting on that. He was known to be a member, and I believe it's William Barclay that pointed this out, Greek scholar William Barclay. There were several factions of spirituality, if you want to put it this way, in Hebrew Israel at this time. First of all, we know the Pharisees and the Sadducees, right? The Pharisees and the Sadducees, of course, we're familiar with them. The, the Sadducees were more of a, they were, they were friendlier with Rome, and they thought they'd be chummy with Rome. So I guess if we, if we would try to, to compare it to what we have here, they thought more government was good. And, and the Pharisees were exactly the opposite. They thought less government was good. I mean, it's almost like two political parties that we know of today, right? So we had those two. Then we had the other one. Now, you don't hear of these except one of the disciples was of this party. And it was not an official party, but it was a group of people that they were known of, and they were called the Zealots. Now, these were extreme nationalists. And the Zealots, of course, they were a bit radical to the point that they were willing to overthrow Rome by force if necessary. So we had to, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they were always arguing with each other. Now, doesn't that sound familiar? Then they had the zealots who were just kind of really loud and in your face about what they thought about politics. That sounds familiar. And then this group here that scholars believe that Zacharias and Elizabeth and Simeon and Anna was part of a group that was known as, listen to this, the quiet in the land. The quiet in the land. They quietly lived out their faith, and they quietly waited with faith and expectation for the coming Messiah. That's a that's a good way to think about greeting the upcoming year. As we navigate the upcoming year, let me just read what Paul said in the book of 1 Timothy chapter 2. It says, Therefore I exert first that all supplication, prayers, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and all who are in authority. And listen to this, that we may lead a quiet life, peaceable in all godliness and reverence that we may lead, listen to this, a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. That's the kind of man this was. He was one of the quiet of the land. And it says this, of course, that the Holy Spirit was upon him. That doesn't sound like it matches. Because in our day and time, when something is spirit-led or somebody's filled with the spirit, quietness doesn't have a lot to do with it. Because a lot of times we think of a spirit-led service, that's the one that's going to be quite lively, maybe a little bit loud. Here's a man who was quiet, but it says the spirit was upon him. 
And he was spirit-led in that he was attentive to the spirit. Now, being spirit-led, being filled with the spirit, having the spirit on you is not always indicated by a lively worship service. Although I do like having some church from time to time and a lively service. But being spirit-led and having the spirit on you is also characterized by, first of all, consistent assurance. In verse 26, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Is it any wonder when Jesus was trying to explain the Holy Spirit to the disciples, and it would come to assist them in a special way later on. He was giving them the promise. The Spirit's going to help you in a special way. He gave the name Comforter. The Comforter will come upon you. Now, to me, that sounds quiet. That sounds calming. That sounds assuring. And you know what? There's a lot of times we need that. We need that. And the Spirit calmly assured him he wouldn't see death before he saw the Lord's Christ. But not only the Spirit gave him continual direction. Verse 27 says, he came by the Spirit into the temple. What does that mean? That meant, for some reason, he came into the temple. It perhaps was not was his regular time to come to the temple. But the Spirit had urged him and led him to come to the temple. And I like to think about it this way. Here he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. That meant it was on his mind. The coming Messiah was on his mind. And the Spirit directed him to the temple. And as he came to the temple, he encountered a young couple with a little baby. This young couple looked, of course, to be of very modest means. And the Spirit said, that's him. And he took the baby up in his arms. How did he know that that baby was the Messiah? The Spirit told him, that's him. He didn't have to tell him anything else. And so he took him in his arms. And let's look at his song. Lord, now you are letting your, de your servant depart in peace. According to your word, my eyes have seen your salvation, which you are prepared before the face of all people, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. I love verse 29. Lord, you're now letting your servant depart in peace. You're going to let me depart in peace. He wasn't talking about leaving the exit door in the temple. The word depart is a Greek word, apaleo. And I love this. Talk about how expressive the Greek language is. The Greek language apaleo means to be released, to be set free. And after all these years of waiting for the consolation and expecting the Messiah, he said, I can be released now and set free. And we know like the Apostle Paul who used another word for depart, he wasn't talking about leaving the temple. He was talking about, I can die in total peace. Because, watch this, I've seen the salvation of the Lord. What a message. What a message for us. No matter what else happens, we can depart in peace when we have seen the salvation of the Lord. And he says this, not just for me. He says, you prepared before the face of all peoples. Now, he didn't say people. He said peoples, plural. And that means all people groups. My people group, but also the other people groups that I don't belong to. He said, your light will be a revelation to the Gentiles. Now, you see the Gentiles, that means everybody else besides the Jewish people. 
And for a devout Jew to say that, he was saying a lot. He said, wow, here's the salvation that God promised to all of Israel. But he said, it's for all peoples, all people groups, and a light to bring revelation to who? The Gentiles. This morning, we spoke of the light. And of course, we also spoke of the light last week in the Christmas story. And we spoke of a passage of scripture concerning the light in Isaiah. But you know, there's two more passages to look at. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 6. We know many of these passages had an immediate fulfillment, but they also had an ultimate fulfillment in Christ. And of course, Isaiah is just filled with prophecies concerning the coming Savior. And in chapter 42, verse 6, it says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness, and I will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. I will give you as a light to the Gentiles to open blind eyes, to set out, bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. A light to the Gentiles. Chapter 49, verse 6. Indeed, he says, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth, not to the border of Israel, to the ends of the earth. So even back then, 700 years before, God had predicted that the message of salvation would go to all of those who weren't of the Jewish faith to the ends of the earth. And then we have Anna. Anna was familiar with pain and sadness. It is said of Anna that she was married at a young age and, and she and her husband lived together for just seven years and her husband died. And now she was well advanced in age. And the language tells us she could either be 84 years old, or it could be rendered that she'd been widowed for 84 years. And you think, how could she be that old? Well, we know they married quite young. And we know that even she, she lived with a husband for seven years, and he died. She would be over 100 years old. It says she was well advanced in years. She could have been 84 years old, or she could have been a widow for 84 years. But we know this, even at just 84 years old, she was married for seven years. That meant she spent a long time missing her husband. She knew what pain was all about. She knew what sadness was all about. But even though she was familiar with pain and suffering, she was frequent in her prayers. It says this in third verse 37. It says, this woman was a widow of about 84 years. She didn't depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. See, she was frequent in her prayers night and day. She found somewhere to stay somewhere close by the temple. It says she was there night and day praying. Now, I know she left and she slept and so forth. She didn't just live there. But it says she fasted and she prayed at all hours. But notice what it says. She served the Lord with her prayers. Prayer is a privilege. Prayer, of course, is a, a wonderful blessing. But we also know prayer is a way we serve God by when we pray for others. God will honor that service. And sometimes that may be your ministry. When it comes where you can't do anything else, you can pray for missionaries. You can pray for those who are working in the church. You can pray for those who are hurting. It is a service. And this woman served the Lord with her prayers, and she was faithful in her witness. Verse 38 says this, 
Coming in at that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord. And listen to what it is. And spoke of him to all those who look for redemption in Jerusalem. Wow, she was a witness. Now, we have three different witnesses that are mentioned in the Christmas story. The shepherds. You remember the shepherds when they came and they came and worshiped Jesus and they returned glorifying God? And it says, and they spoke of him all the time. They spoke to everybody who had listened. They talked to them about Jesus. And then we had Simeon who lifted up his voice in the temple and he said pretty much, this is him. I, I can die because I've seen the Messiah. Here he is. And then we had Anna, who spoke of him to anybody who would listen. That's quite interesting. You see, the angels said, unto you a child is born. This message was validated by three separate witnesses, shepherds, Simeon, and Anna. And the book of Deuteronomy, way back in the law, chapter 19, verse 15 by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter will be established. As if the angel needed witnesses to verify what he said, witnesses verified it from the very first week of the life of Christ. This is indeed the son that is born, the Messiah, the consolation of Israel. Is there anything before we close? Let's stand and be dismissed with a word of prayer. Thank you so much for coming.